Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, Matthew 28, specifically verse 6. Our message is entitled, Just As He Said, from Matthew 28, verse 6. Matthew 28, verse 6, just as he said. Everything the Bible says. Look at your Bibles. How big are they? How much is written in here? Everything it says stands or falls by the resurrection. If the resurrection is not true, none of this has any value. None of this means anything. Everything the Bible says stands or falls by the resurrection. And this isn't just something that I've concocted and come up with to try to make the resurrection the supreme doctrine. There are other things that I would say are at that type of level. But the resurrection is the pinnacle of God's work. It is central to everything we believe. And I didn't just come up with this because the Apostle Paul makes that very point in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. To a group of people who have struggled with the Christian life and have found themselves at every possible turn making bad decisions, and one of the key things he goes back to is they have a fundamentally flawed view of the resurrection. Here's his point from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. That is how important the resurrection is. You don't have Christianity without the resurrection. You don't have eternal life without the resurrection. You don't have justification, meaning for sinners to be declared righteous. Sinful people declared righteous before a holy God. None of that is ours if Christ didn't rise from the dead. And that is the center of what most of the resurrection focus is. That's what most people focus on because it is so important. But actually the resurrection accomplished more than just redemptive purposes. Did you know that? I would say pretty much everything that God has accomplished is multifaceted. You go back to the very creation of the world, Genesis chapter 1. I don't think there's a single work God has ever done that just does one thing and one thing only. He always does a multifaceted work that accomplishes every purpose he sees fit at that time and for that thing. The resurrection is no different. Yes, it gave us justification. Yes, it has secured eternal life. It has guaranteed a resurrection for us in the future. Those are all redemptive things. But it has done more than that. We actually see this in Matthew chapter 8, 28, verse 6. uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 6. Here's what it says. He is not here, for he has risen. And here's the key words for our message this morning. Just as he said. Now, I'll compare this to what I said uh, before the Lord's Supper. And that... There's something implied here. It doesn't come right out and say it, but there is a huge implication in just those simple words, just as he said, that tells us the resurrection has broader purposes. Here's what the angel who speaks that is doing. He's momentarily taking the attention of these women who he's explaining this to. He's taking them off the present thing that is happening that very moment, and he is putting their attention onto something or some things that have happened before. He's comparing them. He's saying he rose just like past experiences that you've had with him should have told you. He's referencing back 
to something in their past. And that would tell us that there are other events based on this verse that we need to know about to know what he is talking about. In fact, Jesus didn't just say it once. There are too many references to him revealing his resurrection for us to even get into. We don't have time for it. There are so many throughout the Gospels. But there are several that are very, very important. And anytime Jesus said anything, I mean, all of Scripture is inspired by God. It is perfect. It is useful or profitable for us. But when Jesus speaks, this would go with any other Scripture, but you think about the Savior speaking on earth to people. Whenever he spoke, he had purpose behind what he was saying. If he revealed his resurrection before it happened, you know what you can guarantee? There is a purpose why he wanted to reveal that. God could have just done it, like many other miracles, and not reveal it ahead of time, and then people are supposed to have the right reaction based on what they see at the time. But God didn't treat the resurrection that way. He didn't just wait till it happened, and then people learn after the fact. He wanted people to know in advance for very important reasons. And there are, I would say, three distinct times that he reveals the resurrection that tell us different things he wanted to accomplish with it. And I believe the key to seeing these is the word signs. On three, at least three separate occasions, Jesus revealed the resurrection as a sign for something else to communicate that when you see the resurrection, you can know this. What are those signs? We'll look at those in just a moment after we read from Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the resurrection, and we thank you that it has accomplished more than just a single purpose, that you so frequently do that with your works with the achievements that you have done throughout history, that you are able to have a multi-threaded, multi-faceted plan from Genesis to Revelation, looking forward to still future events, and that through all of it, you are always working and organizing and moving things in the direction that you see fit to accomplish your goals. And I thank you that the resurrection is one of those central things that you accomplished to secure redemptive things, certainly for us, but also to accomplish other things in your plan that are so necessary. Lord, we are grateful that you are a God who can, that you can take into account all of these purposes that you can do exactly as you please because you are all powerful. Lord, we thank you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So there are three signs that I see that the resurrection accomplished. And the first sign is 
a sign of Christ's authority, a sign of Christ's authority. And we see this in John chapter 2, verse 19. If you would turn with me to John chapter 2, verse 19, we will see that the resurrection was a sign of Christ's authority. Sign of Christ's authority. Now, this account falls during or just after the beginning of Christ's uh, ministry. He's experienced the baptism. John the Baptist um, brought him down into the Jordan River, baptized him. The Holy Spirit descended on him. God the Father at the same time spoke from heaven and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So that's happened. Showing everyone who is present and John the Baptist, who was his forerunner, that absolutely this is the Messiah. Then Jesus goes to the wilderness. He's tempted for a time. And after all of this, he performs his first miracle at a wedding. After that, he decides to go to Jerusalem because the first Passover during his ministry, of which there are four, his ministry covers about three years, beginning in A.D. 30, and it reaches at the beginning, one Passover, and then will complete four Passovers right before his death. This is the first Passover in his ministry. And what he does is he goes to the temple, like so many people do. The Passover is considered one of the three major pilgrim feasts where Jews from all over the Roman world make their way to Jerusalem to observe the Passover feast. And while he's there, he goes to the temple All these people are in the temple, and he notices something immediately as he is there. And we see this in John chapter 2, verse 14. It says, And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Now you read that, and you might think, well, that's bad. That's not something that's supposed to be going on. Not necessarily. We're going to note in a moment how Jesus reacts to it, and that's going to tell us a lot. But before we even get there, this by itself isn't necessarily wrong. There are two categories of people that he observes that are there. Those selling animals for sacrifices and those who are exchanging money. And both of those things could very well be necessary in the temple compound. First, those who sold animals, when people would come to sacrifice an animal, it was necessary that the animal they were sacrificing would be unblemished. There are many passages to support this. Just one, for example, is Deuteronomy chapter 17. This one is not necessarily tied to the Passover observance, but this would be, in most ways, general of sacrifices that were given. In Deuteronomy 17, verse 1, it says, You shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep which has a blemish or any defect, for that is a detestable thing to the Lord your God. The whole point is these sacrifices are supposed to picture perfection, that if they're going to stand in the place of those who are offering them as sinful people who are imperfect, the sacrifice must at least symbolically represent perfection. It can't have a blemish. So if you're traveling, let's say you're on the fringes of the Roman world, you're traveling to Jerusalem, you have a choice. Do I load up animals for the various people that are in our caravan? Or do I decide that maybe when I get there, I can try to buy an animal, an unblemished animal, off of somebody there? So those are kind of the options as far as that goes. Now, We'll get back to that. Now, the money changers are another group of people that I think you would initially say, well, why are there people that are exchanging money? This just seems like, you know, filthy lucre and they're engaged in activities that shouldn't be in a temple. Well, I'll say it this way. In Exodus chapter 30, there was a provision given that if there were going to be extra or I'll say to fund the building of the tabernacle, and then this would be applied later to the temple, that there would be a way to fund it. And the way that God deemed to do that was that a census would be taken. So God put in place that whenever a census was taken, 
every person was required to give, every person was required to give a half shekel. I'll say not every person. Every male was required to give a half a shekel. And it was specifically for the purpose of improvements or maintenance, whatever it might be, for the tabernacle or temple. So again, you look at that and you think, there's a need here because people, when they come to the temple, they need to give this tribute to help improve it. Well, that was given only during a census where they to give a half a shekel. Over time, seeing the opportunity, one king put it in place and then it just stayed, was that it became a yearly thing. A yearly tribute had to be given for each male in Israel so that the temple could have what it needs to run. And so that was one modification that was that happened. But again, if people are coming from all over the Roman world, they would need to, if, if they have a bunch of foreign money and people in Jerusalem can't do anything with it, they would need a means of exchanging it. And so this was something that was at least on the surface acceptable and could be appropriate. But here's where things went wrong. And we see this in how Jesus reacts to it. Let's look at verse 15. It says, And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Jesus' reaction to it is to throw everything around, to create a whip, and to drive people away from this activity. And that tells us just by how he reacts that there was corruption in the process. Because those things, again, just by themselves, were not necessarily wrong. His reaction proves there was corruption. What's well established is during this time, there was a man named Annas, and he's talked about in Scripture. And he was the high priest. It would have been early on in Christ's life he would have been the high priest. And he was deposed by one of the Caesars. And because it was supposed to be a lifetime appointment, he obviously didn't like being deposed. And he set it up so that his sons, five of his sons, would take the high priesthood. And it put him in a position where, for stability's sake, and the nation of Israel and the Sanhedrin all accepted this, that for stability's sake, he would be in the background as sort of the true power behind the priesthood. Yeah, they would have different high priests throughout that. He was the one constant behind it all, and many of them were related to him. This is why in John chapter 18, right after Jesus is arrested, this is why they don't go to Caiaphas, who's the high priest at that time. Who do they go to? It says in John 18, verse 13, And they led him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Annas was the power, and it's well documented in the Mishnah, so that would be Jewish rabbinic writings, that Annas was the one who established this system of commerce in the temple compound. He was the one who was making money off of it. And so here's how it worked. When people would come from throughout the Roman world, Jews from all over, and they would come into the city, it's estimated that there may have been as many as six million people coming into the city at once. They obviously would have to set up tents and camps around the outside of the city walls but as many as six million people would come in, they had a choice. Do I bring an animal with me? And if they chose to bring an animal with them, they would have to have that animal inspected. The person who would inspect it was known as a munche, and he would look it over. He's supposed to be an expert in this. He would look it over, and without fail, do you know what would happen? They would find a defect. Now the person's in a position. Do I travel all the way back to Greece or wherever it is and get another animal? There's no way to do that. Or do I just take what I can get here? So most people, or many people, I'll say, decided and realized there's no point in even bringing an animal. They're going to find a flaw with it 
every single time. It's a perfect system. And then they can charge whatever they want on top of what it's really worth. That was the animal side of it. That's pure corruption. And that was lining the pocket of Annas and his family. The other side of it is that the money exchangers also would not accept any coinage except for a shekel. Now, they could argue that's what Scripture says. That's what the Torah said. It must be a shekel. So if anything had the imprint of the Caesar or any other Roman or Greek currency, no matter what it was, it would have to be exchanged. And if they're the only people who can exchange it, they had a monopoly on that system. And different calculations have estimated it differently. But I would say as a conservative estimate, they had charged and were charging consistently at least 12% on top of everything that came in. These people were making hand over fist money. They made a lot of money. So that gives you some context to why Jesus would be so angry. It's not that sacrifices were being provided for the people. It's not that they were even paying a temple tax, even though that had already been altered into something it wasn't originally designed to be. It was the deep corruption that was going on. So when Jesus does this, he's standing on sure ground. Not only is he the Messiah, but he is right here. So notice how they respond to him. Verse 18, the Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Now, let me ask you this. If if you owned a business and somebody came in off the street and started throwing shelves on the ground and flipping tables and messing everything up, would you ask, what authority do you have to do this thing? Is that the way you would respond to them? Or would there be some level of force or a phone call to the police? Probably the latter. Why do they respond by saying, what sign do you give us? He's coming in to their system. This is from their perspective. They are the leaders, the people talking to him. It says the Jews. The Jews is another way of speaking of the Jewish leadership. These are the head honchos. And he's doing this in their territory. And they respond by saying, what sign? There's a couple of reasons. One is, he acted with total authority. And the second is, they knew what they were doing was wrong. You don't respond that way unless you know you're in the wrong. So they ask for a sign. And this is a usual and very frequent thing that they would do with anyone, but that Jesus met over and over again. And we see this in 1 Corinthians one twenty two, that Paul says the Jews often did this. He says in 1 Corinthians one twenty two, for indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. For the Jews to submit to anything, any authority, any person telling them to do their system differently, they always wanted a sign to prove it. Okay, prove it to us if we're supposed to do this. And this goes all the way back to the beginning of their nation. When God called Moses, Moses is walking along in the land of Midian, and he sees a burning bush that's not consumed. And the bush talks to him, and he realizes it is God speaking to him. And as he speaks with God, God commissions him and says, you're going to go to the Pharaoh, but you're also going to go to the Hebrews in the land of Egypt. And you're going to tell them that God is commanding them to go out of Egypt. His concern is, well, why would they listen to me? Why are they going to go with me? So God tells him his memorial name, his special name, Yahweh. And then Moses pushes back again. Okay, so I say that. What if they don't listen to me then? So God gives him something. He gives him signs that he can perform. These signs would prove that Moses comes from God and that he has the authority of God behind what he says and what he does. So the three signs are that he would take his staff, he would drop it to the ground, and it would become a serpent. When he picks it back up again, it would be a staff again. The other is that he would put his hand in his cloak, and when he brings his hand out, it would be leprous. Just like the first one, when he does that again, 
it's back to normal. And the final one, God says, and he adds this just as an insurance policy. If they don't believe those two, here's a third one. Take some water from the Nile River, and take it to dry ground, and pour it out on it, and it will turn to blood. Three miraculous signs to prove that Moses spoke with authority before God. And that is what is in the minds of Jewish people to this very day. But back then, when they're asking Jesus, give us a sign, they are always looking for, prove yourself if you're coming in here and you are telling us how to run things, how Judaism should operate, prove it to us. What is the sign that Jesus gives them? John chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, that obviously is somewhat cloaked language. He's putting in it in a figure of speech, but the passage comes right out and tells us what he's saying. Verse 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Clearly, Jesus gives the resurrection as a sign to the Jewish leadership at that time. You know what it was? When you see the resurrection, you know that what I said is true and that what you were doing is corrupt. It proves their corruption because Jesus is the authority and he has the right to tell them whatever he wants them to do. So it would only be after the resurrection. They can deny him and reject him all throughout his life. But it's when the resurrection happens that if they even have the tiniest bit of intellectual honesty, they would stop and they'd say, we are deeply corrupt. Jesus proved that when he rose from the dead. Now there's a second sign. The second sign is a sign of Christ's judgment. Christ's judgment, and we have to turn back to Matthew chapter 12 for this sign. Matthew chapter 12 to see the sign of Christ's judgment. And I'm going to just have to abbreviate this to some extent here. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40 specifically. But one thing we need to look at first in understanding Christ's judgment here is we have to understand the purpose for which Christ came the first time. We know he's coming again. Why did he come to earth? Now, I said already, God accomplishes many different things with everything he does. And that is true of this. He came for multiple purposes. But one of the main purposes, one of the most obvious purposes that many Christians skip right over and they spiritualize is that Jesus Christ came for Israel and he came to do something among Israel. Gentiles were not the first thing on his mind. We get the blessing of after everything is said and done, he's doing this amazing work in the body of Christ. But his first concern, his first priority was to Israel. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, shares at the beginning of his ministry what his focus was and what his message was. Matthew 4, verse 17. It says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is one of the most misused verses in all of scripture. This is presented as the salvation message. This is how you come to Christ and you receive eternal life. That's not what this verse is about at all. Repent means change your mind. That's what repent means. Now, Israel was in a position where they needed a change of mind because, as we've already seen, they were corrupt, especially at the leadership level. And their practices were legalistic, meaning they were trying to work for God's favor, and they thought that just by their heritage, they would make it into the kingdom as individuals. The kingdom is absolutely for Israel. It is still a future thing. But no individual Jewish person gets in just by blood. Something has to change spiritually. 
Jesus' message is, the kingdom is right here. It's at hand. That expression at hand means it's within reach. You can grasp it, but will you? Because what you need to do is change your mind about the way you are before God as a nation. That's his message. This is not a salvation message. This is the millennial, or we'll say messianic kingdom, is ready to be implemented if Israel receives the Messiah the right way. So Jesus offered that. And Jesus proved that he was, in fact, the Messiah and the perfect object of their faith as a nation. We can see this in how Jesus explains the proof of his Messiahship in Matthew chapter 11. So this is into Jesus' ministry some ways, and he's already been performing miracles. And this is during a time when John the Baptist finds himself in prison. And while he's in prison, I guess you can sympathize with him, he starts to doubt. He starts to wonder, why am I in such a bad situation? And why does it not seem like the things we see in the Old Testament, the kingdom and it being implemented, are really here yet? What's holding it all up? So in a moment of weakness, John sends two disciples to Jesus, and he asks, are you the expected one, or should we look for another? John already knew. He testified that when he saw the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus, he knew, he says this in John chapter 1, he knew that he was the Messiah. And yet while he's in prison, he's questioning, are you the expected one? Should we look for another? And how does Jesus prove to him that he is, in fact, the Messiah? He says to those disciples, he says, tell him what you hear and see. Matthew 11, 5. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. What's the proof? that Jesus gave that he is the Messiah? Signs, miracles. They are proof. They were certain to Israel. Now look at Matthew chapter 12. It says in verse 22, Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him, so that the mute man spoke and saw. He performs a miracle. Isn't that what he just said is the proof that he is the Messiah? How does the leadership of Israel respond to what is the sign proof, the certain proof that he's the Messiah? Verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. So if his miracles were the sure proof that he is the Messiah and the leadership of Israel responds to them by saying, he's actually performing them by Satan. That is the most textbook rejection of him as their Messiah there can be. And notice how Jesus describes this a little further down. He says in verse 31, Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. The unpardonable sin. They just committed it. And you will look and read things online, and if you open a commentary anytime, you will find the most confusing explanations for what this is. Well, this is if you don't believe in miracles, and this is if you say this or that. This is not something any Gentile could ever commit. It's not the context. What was the purpose of his miracles? To prove he's the Messiah to Israel. And if he's the Messiah, he brings the kingdom with him. When they rejected that, they made it so that they can't be forgiven in that they will not receive him as their Messiah, and they will not therefore receive the kingdom, the very thing he brought to offer. This is 
a generational curse. This is not for individuals. This is not something that was forever for Israel. This is for generation. That generation, when they rejected him, guaranteed the door is closed. God will do something else for now. And there will be a time when Israel receives what is promised, but it will not be in your lifetime. That door, that time has passed. Now, how do I know that this is a generational curse? That this isn't focused on individuals? That this is focused on the whole nation of Israel at that time? Look with me at Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 45. It says in 38, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Ah, they're looking for another sign. But let's look at something really quick, and we'll come back to this. What does it say in verse 39? He says, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. Verse 41, he says, The men of Nineveh Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it. Verse 42, the queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it. Verse 45, at the very end, he says, that is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Jesus was dealing with the nation as a whole, as a generation for that time. And what they did was they rejected him as their Messiah and the kingdom and him taking the throne in Jerusalem was postponed. You know what we still haven't seen today? We haven't seen him take the throne in Jerusalem because this is still operating. Israel doesn't get to have their king without receiving or their kingdom without receiving their king. Only when Israel receives him will they finally get their kingdom. So it's in that context that when the Pharisees ask him for a sign, even though he just performed a sign, he healed somebody, they should know this is proof that he's the Messiah. When they ask for a sign, he says, I'm not going to give you a sign. Well, except I'll give you one. Here's what the sign is, verse 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That is the sign that he gives to Israel. And because we're crunched on time, let me just suffice it to say, here is why he uses this in the first place. He is connecting something that went on with Jonah to what was present then and what the resurrection would do. I believe there are at least three main points of connection between Jonah's miraculous, or uh, what happened with Jonah and why he is connecting that to the resurrection. The first is what happened with Jonah being swallowed by a sea creature and surviving in there for three days is one of the greatest miracles ever performed. It's something that is so astounding that most people who are not Christians absolutely reject it and scoff at it and think it is the silliest thing on earth. And yet, it absolutely happened. As a historical fact, Jonah was swallowed by a sea creature and survived that way for three days. The comparison of time is the other thing that Jesus is pointing out between Jonah's experience and what the resurrection will do, that it is three days and three nights. And again, without getting into too much detail there, um, people make a whole big deal out of, it says three days and three nights. And so the, um, the burial or the time that Jesus was dead cannot be uh, any less than full Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So an entire weekend. That's just not how Jews, I know it seems very strange to us as modern listeners, that's not how Jews reckon time. They reckon time that a partial day is counted as a day, and yes, saying a day and a night, even if it's only part of a day, is an appropriate reckoning of time. So he's drawing a comparison there. And then the final thing is that he is with those things. He says, this is like Jonah, this sign will be like Jonah, but there's a contrast. 
It's not only similar to it, it's different. Because when Jonah went to Nineveh, how did the Ninevites respond to him? They responded by receiving what he said. He went into the city of Nineveh, an outsider, a Jew walking into hostile territory, Gentile territory, and he has the audacity to say, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And he does that. And how do they respond? It says they believed in God. And they put on sackcloth and ashes and showed that they were serious about this. And Jesus' whole point is, what a shame that Israel, who has greater revelation, who has a greater messenger, and has a greater miracle that will be performed, can't respond even a fraction as much as the Ninevites did. So when he rose from the dead, it was proof. It showed that generation of Israel that it was over. At least for that generation, it was over. The kingdom's gone. The kingdom will be in the future for another generation of Israel, but you don't get it. And again, any Jewish person living at that time who would just take a moment to reflect, would realize, we lost out. The king was right here. And the proof is he rose from the dead. And then finally, there is a third sign. And this is very much related to what most people um, focus on with the resurrection. And that is that it was a sign of Christ's promise. A sign of Christ's promise. Now, if you will turn to Matthew chapter 16, so just a few chapters to the right, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, we see after their rejection that there is this transitional period where God, actually through Christ, is shifting his program, his focus away from Israel and onto new things that he's going to do. Something that is being revealed slowly but increasingly that he is going to bring about a body of believers who are from all people, not just Jews, Jews and Gentiles, and that's what will be known as the church. In Matthew 16, 21, we see one of these very transitional um, program-shifting type of things taking place. It says in verse 21, from that time, from that time. Remember, we just looked at another verse, Matthew 4, 17, that said, from that time, he began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is a way of stating something new is happening. There's a new focus here. At that time, Matthew 4, 17, Jesus' ministry was just beginning and he was ready. He had been prepared. Now he was able to offer in full the kingdom to Israel. We just saw why that time has passed and his focus shifts again. And it says in Matthew 16, 21, from that time, what does Jesus do differently? Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. This is where he begins to clearly, plainly start to reveal what's going on, what he is going to accomplish in the future regarding his death and his resurrection. He begins to show his disciples to prepare them for it. This is only after Israel has rejected him. And just before this, Peter and the disciples showed that they accept him because Peter has just confessed, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. With that, Jesus is ready to reveal to them the resurrection. And so how does this serve as a sign? Well, John chapter 20, verse 30 makes it clear that the resurrection as a sign fits into this, to reveal the resurrection for a specific purpose. John 20, verse 30 says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. What was going on just before verse 30? It says, therefore, it's a concluding statement based on what just happened. And it says other signs. So what just happened must be one of those signs. 
what was going on in that passage is that Thomas had been very upset that the other disciples got a chance to see Jesus risen from the dead to the point where he didn't believe. He thought they were just messing with him. And he said, unless I place my finger in his hand, his wound, and in his side, I won't believe. So Jesus appears finally when Thomas is there. And before Jesus offers him, but before he can even do that, Jesus declares, my Lord and my God. He knew. He knew right there and then. It is after that that John says, therefore, many other signs, meaning Jesus' resurrection and his appearance was a sign that proved something. And here's the purpose behind the sign is in John chapter 14, verse 29. John 14, 29. This is during that last time that Jesus gets to, gets to spend with his disciples in the upper room, having the Passover, fe Passover feast. He's explaining things to them about the coming church age. This is before he dies. And he says, of why he's revealing these things to them, he says, John 14, 29, Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. You may believe when it happens. That's one of the reasons he reveals the resurrection ahead of time. And in the preceding verse, he says, if I go, I will come to you. It tells us if he leaves, he's referring to his death, he's going to come again. That would imply his resurrection. He says, I've told you this before it happens so that when it happens, you may believe. Now, Really briefly here, this is one of the oddities we see in Scripture, is even though Jesus has several different times where he speaks to the disciples and he explains this to them, how do they, how, what is their understanding? What is their level of understanding of the resurrection leading up to it? Well, John 20, verse 9 shows us they didn't quite get it. It says in John 20, verse 9, actually verse 8 says that the disciple whom Jesus loved, he ran to the tomb, and when he saw the tomb, it says, he saw and believed. Verse 9, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And then John chapter 2, verse 22. John 2, 22. This is back in that passage we were looking at just before. It says, when he said, tear down this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. And it says, he was talking about the temple of his body. Here's what it says. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. You mean to tell me it was only when he was raised from the dead that they believed in him finally? And we can go to our next verse, Mark 8, verse 32. That, which is a parallel passage if you're still in Matthew 16, 21. This is Mark's version of what's going on in Matthew 16 when Jesus begins to speak to them about his death and resurrection. Mark 8, 32 says, And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter clearly understood the implications at that time. Lord, you're saying you're going to die? And he doesn't like that, so he rebukes Jesus. Jesus was speaking plainly. What on earth was left on the table for the disciples that it took them till he rose from the dead for them to finally get it and to believe? It says that Jesus had to open their minds for them to believe. Luke chapter 24. This is one of these accounts of his resurrection appearance to his disciples. Luke 24, verse 44 says, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. But let me contrast that. This will be our Final thought here. Let me contrast that with another group of people. This is how the disciples understood this. Jesus says specifically, I have told you these things so that 
when the time comes, you would believe. So it is looking to the time of his resurrection. But throughout that, his disciples didn't understand, they didn't believe. Look at what this other group of people understood about it. Matthew 27, verses 63 through 64. This is right after Jesus has been buried. And this is the Pharisees and the chief priests, and they go to Pilate. It says in Matthew 27, verse 63, they said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. They understood what Jesus was saying. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead and the last deception will be worse than the first. So the disciples couldn't understand it. They couldn't believe it. It says even when they were looking at him, the words in Greek are, they did not believe. Even when he was standing before him, before them in his resurrection body. They did not believe. He had to open their minds. And yet, those who rejected him, these chief priests and Pharisees speaking to Pilate, they understood exactly what he was getting at. The point is, the resurrection was designed. There is something unique about it. It was designed to be the thing that would take the disciples from being inadequate, and they are just of themselves like any other person, incompetent, slow in their understanding, to having the confidence and the unwavering faith in Christ that you see later, and it all hinges on the resurrection, and that when it happened, that belief set in. They finally believed. And I'm not saying they weren't saved before that. I believe we're dealing with a transitional period where different, I would say, different understandings of what God has accomplished is is in flux with the Messiah. So before, they didn't understand the resurrection. They're trying to wrap their heads around it. After, they understand the resurrection and they proclaim it steadfastly. That's that transitional period. And that is one of the ultimate purposes of the resurrection that God accomplished through Christ. So that we can know. We can know several different things. Number one, everything Christ did based on the sign of his authority, he did with absolute authority and he was right in. And that humanity and specifically Israel is corrupt. We can know that they've been judged. And so we do look forward to when Israel finally receives the kingdom. Because guess what? If you're a Gentile, every one of you who are in Christ benefits when Israel receives their kingdom. And finally, the sure hope of eternal life that the resurrection secures as a sign that Jesus Christ has secured and guaranteed life for any person who believes in him. That's what the resurrection proves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you did accomplish through the resurrection and that it wasn't just a single purpose, that you have so much that you can do with just one event, just one thing. Lord, thank you for these different accounts that involve Jesus telling people things ahead of time, preparing different groups of people And Lord, thank you that we can look back on that and learn different things about your program and what you've accomplished. Lord, we thank you that Israel is still a part of your program and that you have wonderful things ahead for them. And Lord, thank you that right now, all, whether Jew or Gentile, because of Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead, that right now we can have eternal life and that there never needs to be a doubt, there never needs to be any worry in our mind that we are secure in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We pray this in Christ's name.